Hey, what's up? Jason here from Community3D.College. A couple days ago, I sent out a quick survey just to get some questions, and today I'm going to be answering them. If you have some questions of your own that you want answered in a future Q&A, just uh, click the link below, go fill out the form, send me your question, and I'll try to get to it on there. So let's just get started. All right, let's start with this question. Do you consider it worth spending time and money to study in a specialized college like Full Sail or VFS, or can we learn the same by ourselves? Uh, this, I think it depends a little bit on what it is that you want to study. If it's the film side, I really have no clue. I don't know if you can learn that stuff on your own or get access to the equipment that you need and you know all of the information that's available. Uh, but for game development, I would say you could probably save yourself a lot of money and a lot of time learning how to do these things online and just spending the time building your projects. Now, the benefit of these bigger programs and these full schools is that there is some accountability. You've spent a lot of money and you have people there watching constantly to make sure that you're showing up and doing the bare minimum. The problem there though is that you can kind of get by with the bare minimum and you can graduate from a lot of colleges. I don't know about these ones specifically, but a lot of colleges you can just kind of get all the way through there and never really learn how to do the work. You can you know, learn some of the concepts, learn a light idea of how things are done, but never actually get into real game development where you're building games. And if you're going to go to college for two or four years, um, just remember that in that time you could have built many, many games. Now, it's not easy to do, right? It's not like it's super simple to just go out there and learn everything online and figure it all out yourself, but it's more than possible and it's dramatically cheaper. And if you're really driven and motivated, it's extremely fast in comparison. I mean, you think about, I just think about when I was back in school, we always kind of went at the pace of the slowest people in the class, or at least like the slowest 20%. So there's constantly reviewing and retalking about things that you know, if you're near the top or you know, even just paying a lot of attention and studying outside of class, you should know all this stuff and you should be able to go a lot faster. So I guess um, overall, I would avoid those unless you either don't think that you'll be able to do anything on your own or you've tried to do it on your own multiple times and failed. I definitely recommend at the very least, take a couple online courses, go through some online tutorials and um, actually build games. The best way to get good at game development is actually building games. Watching people, talking about it, uh, it, it can help, but it's not gonna be nearly as fast as just doing. I think that's kind of the case for just about anything that you do in life though. Actually doing the work and doing the thing is a whole lot better than learning about it. You'll, you'll get it faster, you'll pick it up faster, and you'll have a much better understanding. All right, this next question is about object pooling. It reads, hi, I'm implementing my object pool and facing a problem. When I disable the game object during an animation, the last position of the bones is set as the default and they stay like that. And when I enable it, the animation seems distorted. How should I reset the animation and the sprite rotation, color position, all that stuff? Uh, it's a great question. So this will happen a lot in pooling. If you're changing the state of the pooled objects, you really need to have a reset method or reset functionality. Um, in this case, what I would recommend is in the pooling system itself, when it enables, it should run a reset method on that object. And then the default values should just be stored or cached off at the beginning. So when the object is created, get that rotation, position, scale, anything that you're gonna be changing on there and uh, cache that in the object and then with the reset just flip back over to those. For the animation, just make sure that you stop all the animations before you add the object back into the pool. So a lot of time what I'll do is have an abstract method on the pooled objects. This is when I use a, a, a pooled mono behavior base class there. And then on that, um, there'd be like an on disabling or on disable or on return to pool. And in there, just stop all animations if it has animations it's playing and uh, prepare to do the reset. You could even do the reset on the return to pool. It'd probably be better than doing it um, on, on the time when you're pulling it out of the pool. 
This question's about virtual reality, and it just reads, how do you avoid motion sickness when making a VR game? Now, there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, the first and most obvious is just don't move the player, but that's kind of a lame answer, right? Um, the bigger thing to do is when you're moving players, especially if you're just moving them like in a direction, number one thing is to avoid any um, acceleration or deceleration. You want to just go straight steady speed. The acceleration and deceleration does some trickiness with your brain and makes you feel a little nauseous and makes you start to tumble, makes people kind of fall over. So if you just make it smooth, it, it's a lot better. Also going fast seems to be a lot better. One of the other things that I like to do is uh, pull in the field of view too, or not so much the field of view, but what it is put like a mask over the front of the camera. So I'll just have like a, uh, a quad that's sitting in front of the camera and then pull in the view kind of like a vignette. So you can only see a little circle there and it goes back out. You see that in, um, I think Spider-Man did a really good job of that, the Spider-Man VR game. Um, in addition to that, not rotating players is really important. So if you have a player going along and then you just rotate the player on your own, it will generally make people sick. I, I experimented with that a lot when VR first came out and that was by far the worst thing you could do. Even really slow rotation, just turning the whole world on them was pretty bad. Now doing, if you wanna do like a flash rotation, that seems to be fine. Or if you just let the player actually turn, you know, in a room scale game, they could just physically turn around and they're good. Um, well, those are kind of the, the key things that I always look for again, just no acceleration, uh, pull in that view, and don't rotate them. Just, just do those, and you should be pretty good. For the most part, most people will be fine, not get sick. All right, this next question is about jobs. This person writes in that they got an internship working in Unity, and the internship's gonna last three months, and then, depending on performance, they're gonna offer a full-time position with a little bit of a salary increase. And they're making games for kids. It says they do a lot of reskinning and ads, and the question there is just, should I join such a place? I'm about to graduate, is it worth it for learning? In this case, I'd say definitely yes. So if you don't have a different opportunity that seems better and more interesting, I'd definitely recommend that you just jump on this and take full advantage of it. Go in there and really look at their process, see how they're building their games and what you can learn from them. They may or may not have good processes and good code. You'll find out as you get there. But um, either way, you're gonna learn. You're gonna, you're, it's best to work alongside other developers and really kind of watch what they do, learn some of their techniques and tips and just tricks along the way. Now, one thing I would recommend though is don't take the position and then stay in it forever. You know, if it's not something where you're growing and enjoying it you know after a year start looking and find something else it's really good to kind of go around to a couple different places and see what the different types of uh, studios are doing and how they work on their projects because there's a big variation there and you can learn a lot just from you know going from place to place but i would definitely recommend you know, starting out working with a team and just being able to learn from them you'll learn a lot faster than you will just working on your own. Now, that said, don't stop working on your side projects at home and your own personal things as well. And then one thing you'll learn is that you can start taking things that you're picking up at work and bring those into your side projects and then vice versa. You can start you know, learning new things, new techniques that you need for your personal games and start showing those off at work. And it'll make a big difference at work, but it, again, it, mostly it's gonna make a big difference in the, uh, the learning and the experience just kind of watching and seeing how people build things. So definitely recommend you do it. Um, just don't stay there forever if you don't like the job. This next question is about a game type that I've never actually built. It reads, for a 3D endless runner with a decent amount of world geometry, would you recommend moving the player or everything else in the world? If the player is being moved, some sort of origin reset system would be used to reset everything back to the origin occasionally. Yeah, I've so again, I've never built an endless runner myself, but having built a decent number of games, I would definitely lean towards the idea of just moving the world geometry and just spawning in that geometry when it's, you know, visible and close and then despawning or, or probably just pushing it back out to a pooled system. 
Um, I could be wrong. There could be some benefits to moving the player and doing a reset, but I can't think of anything offhand. Just the way that I picture building an endless runner, I just think it'd be better and cleaner constantly pulling those things in. Um, especially once you start adding things like rotation. I think it's just going to get more and more complicated if you start trying to move the player around and then bounce everything back constantly. So yeah, I'd, I'd go with the moving the world geometry, but if anybody reading or watching this has um, some real experience with a 3D runner and wants to share that, I, I'd love to see a comment below that just helps kind of add on to this or tell me I'm totally wrong and give them some better advice. Next, we've got a question about mobile revenue. It just reads... Which is more beneficial in terms of revenue generation, iOS or Android? This is um, a pretty common question that I see a lot. And when I talk to other developers, especially ones who do a lot of mobile stuff, it seems that it's relatively even. Uh, occasionally they'll tell me, you know, iOS is 60% and Android's 40, or really it's like 50 and 40 and then 10% on other stuff, or it'd be the reverse. Uh, people tend to have a lot more Android installs, and then the revenue per user is quite a bit higher on iOS. So I don't think that there's any specific monetary reason to target one versus the other. And in reality, what I would highly recommend is just target them both. And also, if you can, target some of the less popular platforms too, because they they don't add a lot, but you could add on another 5 to 10% to your revenue just by pulling in some of the other systems that aren't as widely supported as Android and iOS. And with Unity, it can be a relatively simple process. It could, you know, it could just be a process of going through the deployment and doing some test builds. And you may not have to change much, if anything, in code. But yeah, neither one really seems to stand out ahead, at least from everything that I've seen and everybody that I've talked to personally. So I just go for both of them, or if you really can only do one, pick the one that you like the best. But yeah, don't do that. Just, just do them both. Now we've got another job-related question, and it says, for someone who's allowed themselves to become skill stagnant in their current job, what would be a good way to pick up a more current skill and to show familiarity in the skill to prospective employers? I think this is a great question. It happens to a lot of people. You get into the job and just keep uh, doing the same thing, same work over and over, same project, and not really learning much. Um, it's something I always recommend people try really hard to avoid, and a reason I don't recommend staying at a place for too long, especially if this starts to become the case. Now, ways that you can get new skills or just improve on your skills. I'll start with the, the first and most obvious, the one that I tell everybody all the time, which is just have a side project that you're working on at home. If it's a game, that's awesome. Build the game and take advantage of that time to try out new functionality and new features and see if they kind of fit into there. Now, if you're not doing that, well, first you should, but if you can't for some reason, then also try doing this at work too. So if you have new projects come up, you know, spend a couple hours trying um, a little bit of research and looking into different ways that you can implement the same thing. You know, find out about a new programming paradigm, new models for stuff. Um, there, there are a lot of ways to do this. And then um, also just constantly be learning. So I highly recommend podcasts. Listen to just different podcasts related to the technology that or technologies that you're using or interested in. It's a great way to find out about new things and then find out if you want to kind of dive in more. In fact, uh, just a couple days ago, I heard something awesome on a uh, Coding Blocks podcast and learned about a new feature that I had no idea about that I'm really excited to, to give a try. So I highly recommend just podcasts. Um, Pluralsight videos are great too, just going through and learning random things that are semi-related to what you're doing, but they'll kind of help you build up new skills. And then of course, like I said, side projects or trying to bring it into your work and trying out new stuff in there. The last question I wanted to hit today is about time-saving features. Well, it says, are there any time-saving features of Unity or the asset store packages that you wish you knew about before? And the answer is most definitely. There are quite a few. The first one that I, 
always tell people to use is Text Mesh Pro. It's an amazing asset, makes your text look beautiful, runs better, it's just all around great replacement for text in your game. If you're doing any text at all, UIs, anything like that, just drop in Text Mesh Pro, make the swap now. Um, other than that, I like Pro Builder. I wish I had known about that one before. I didn't really get much experience with it up until pretty recently, and now that it's free, there's zero excuse for anybody to not give it a try and just kind of get used to the workflow in there. It's nice for building out quick samples, um, mocking out areas, gray boxing, or even just building some levels. I mean, I've seen some nicely built levels done in there. Personally, I just use it to kind of prototype out areas, though, and give that off to an artist. But I love it. Um, also, ProGrades, another great one that's now free and included in there. Um, Odin Inspector is another one that I really like. It's uh, by DevDog, and it kind of just adds a ton of functionality to the Inspector. It lets you do a lot of things that you wouldn't that you would think you should be able to do in the inspector but can't and it kind of just brings that inspector up to the next level highly recommend trying that one out and then of course uh cinemachine is another great one you should definitely give that a try if you're working on any sort of interesting camera controls at all it's pretty cool pretty powerful and it does a lot of that for you and there are a whole bunch of other assets that i could recommend i've done some posts on this before i think i'll do another video and just kind of highlight some of my favorites sometime in the near future. All right, so I think that's all I can answer for today. If you submitted a question, I didn't get to it yet. I'm sorry, I'll try to get to those later. There's just a lot that came in. And if you have a question that you want to ask, feel free to just click on the link down below. There'll be a link to the form. You can just submit it, or if you're on my email list, just shoot me an email. And I'll try to do these a little bit regularly. If, if people find them interesting and I keep getting good questions, I'll keep uh, keep answering them. All right, well, and. Ah, damn it.